Welcome to the local campaign and thank you for joining us for our debate for Innis Ward, Ward 2. I'm going to introduce the candidates who are seeking your vote on October the 22nd in just a moment, but I'll start by going over the format for our debate. We are going to allow each of the candidates one minute to introduce themselves to you. So we'll go in an order that was determined at random just before our telecast. After that, we'll move to a series of debates about the important issues in Innis Ward and throughout the city of Ottawa. To start each debate, I'll ask one candidate a question. That candidate will have 45 seconds to respond to that question on his or her own. Then we'll open it up to several minutes of debate during which all of the candidates can participate. They can offer their thoughts, challenge each other, ask each other questions, respond to what the other candidates are saying. We'll do several minutes of debate on a number of different topics that way. And in each case, we'll wrap up the debate with uh, 30 seconds allotted to the candidate to whom the question was originally directed, that person will be able to wrap up that topic on his or her own. Again, we'll move through a number of different topics that way, and then we'll have closing statements, which will be one minute in length, and they'll be in the opposite order of the opening statements. So, let's meet the candidates who are asking for your vote on October the 22nd in Innes Ward. They are Laura Dudas, François Trépanier, Donna Leith Goodbrenson and Tammy Lynch. Hello. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us for the debate. And we'll start with the opening statements. And Laura Dudas, you're first. Go ahead. Thank you, Mark. My name is Laura Dudas, and I am running for City Council in Innis Ward. For the past eight years, I've been the elected president of the Blackburn Community Association. And then that role, I've had the privilege of working with residents, businesses, and community <clears throat> groups to advocate to council and to the councillor's office on their behalf. Now, as I'm knocking on doors throughout the ward, I'm hearing the same concerns and priorities from residents that we've been talking about for well over a decade for the East End. A lack of economic development and job growth, our road infrastructure deficit and the need for the Brian Colburn extension, deteriorating roads and improving transit, protecting and enhancing our green spaces, ensuring property taxes are reasonable and affordable, and providing the police services with the resources they need to do their job. Innis Ward and the East End have so much potential and we just need a councillor who will get us there. All right, thank you. Next up, François Trépanier, you have 60 seconds. Go ahead. Thank you, Mark. Good day. You may remember me. I'm François Trépanier. I was a candidate in Innis, Ward, in Innis Ward four years ago, and I am still here, running for the second time, promoting the ward as I have been since I moved here in 2012. As a former Canadian Forces officer with 28 years service to our country, our family was required to move a lot. Innis Ward is where we have established our home, and Innis Ward is where we live. I have been involved in the community everywhere I have lived. I currently co-chair the Blackburn Fun Fair Parade. I volunteer with 51 Air Cadet Squadron. I am on the board of director of Vintage Stock Theatre, and I am a Rotarian, very much involved in fundraising for local organizations. Since retiring from the Canadian Forces three years ago, I have become a successful entrepreneur, and this makes me the best positioned candidate to understand the challenges of local businesses and puts me in a position to bring meaningful employment to the ward. Transparency, integrity, and equity are three principles by which I live and I conduct my campaign. My platform is based on improving local economy, improving transportation, supporting environmental initiatives, and developing the right infrastructure for us all. I am okay, that's Tipping. time. Thank you. Next up is Donna Leith Goodbranson. Go ahead. Hello, I'd like to uh, start by thanking Rogers for, uh, for organizing this debate today. I've been a resident of Innes Ward uh, for 25 years and of Orleans for the last 36 years. Uh, my husband and I chose to move to Orleans in 1993 because we wanted our four children to have the opportunity to live and play in a bilingual environment and to attend francophone schools. I've been heavily involved in our community in, uh, as president of the, uh, the uh, Ecole Elementaire Publique Le Prélude uh, School and uh, involved as uh, vice president and president of the Chapel Hill South Community, community Association. I've also been spokesperson for CHEO and have done a lot of fundraising for various organizations. And where I stand out in this election is in my ex extensive experience working at City Hall, responding to our residents' needs. I proudly work for Councillor Rainer Bloison in this ward for six years and for Councillor Tim Tierney in for the last six months. I've been a volunteer, I've worked side by side with two city councillors and I'd li now like to take that one step further and bring my leadership experience and commitment to council table. All right, thank you. Finally, the opening statement from Tammy Lynch. Go ahead. 
Hello, I'm Tammy Lynch and I'm running for City Council for Innisward. For the past 19 years, my husband and I have raised our family in the Chapel Hill <coughs> South community of Innisward. I have a lot of extensive community involvement and volunteerism. I was Vice President of the Blackburn Minor Hockey Association for 10 years and I was also on the Parent Council of Good Shepherd Catholic School. I've been working as the Director of Community Relations in the Innis Ward office and until my leave of absence, uh, now I've decided to run for City Council. I'm aware of the concerns in the five communities in our ward. I feel like I have an advantage because I've been dealing with residents and city staff and I know the issues and I am ready to get the work done on day one. There will be no learning curve because I'm aware of all the files that are ongoing on Innis Ward and I'm looking forward to this debate and thank you to Rogers TV. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all the candidates for your opening statements. We're going to start to debate some of the issues now in Innis Ward and throughout the City of Ottawa. And I'll start with a question for Laura Dudas. The City will move into Phase 2 of light rail during the next four years. What lessons have been learned from Phase 1 and what can be done differently going forward? You know, LRT and Stage 2 is going to be a, an enormous opportunity for people living in Innis Ward. It's going to bring benefits to our existing commuters. We have about 80% of our population is commuting out of the East End every day. It's going to make commute times faster. The only thing is we need to make sure that our bus routes are improved so that it can connect people to the train easily and make it convenient, a convenient option to get people out of their cars. We also see it as an opportunity for economic development. As councillor, I would ensure that we're taking LRT stations and using them as economic development hubs, using tax incentives to bring businesses to those stations and making sure that LRT is really the impetus for bringing growth, job growth and business. Okay, it's open to everyone now on phase two of light rail and uh, how it needs to be managed going forward. I'll, I'll start for sure. It's great that the LRT is going to uh, into phase two uh, along St. Joseph for 174. But certainly, this is not where the development is happening. Development is happening south of Venice Road. And I believe, you know, if, if it's too late for phase two, we certainly should start considering phase three now to bring uh, LRT to uh, Orleans South. You know, having the Brian Colburn extension and adding dedicated bus lanes to that would be a strong answer to addressing the residential growth and the number of commuters we have coming from South Orleans. We need to make sure that the, the extension is built and, and tie it into the LRT network. That would provide a way to get people onto the bus, make commute times faster, and ensure that we're looking to the future growth of the East End. If I could bring it back to the, uh, to the LRT coming out to Trim Road, this is an excellent opportunity for the for St. Joseph Boulevard to be developed. Now, the, along the, uh, the stations, there will be transit-oriented development, which means that there will be, there will be uh, housing units that will be built uh, in that area, and it will become uh, uh, nicely populated, and this is the perfect opportunity to redevelop the St. Joseph Boulevard that has been uh, in, in the, on the books for revitalization since the inception of the Heart of Orleans uh, BIA in 2008. This is a great opportunity and I'd hate to miss it. If we want to get residents on LRT, especially the residents in our ward that are south, we need to improve our local routes. If we do not improve our local routes, we, there's been a lot of cuts to local routes lately. I've been hearing it at the doors. I've been getting emails. If we do not improve those, no one is going to get on a bus and go to Blair Station and get on that train in November. So we need to start with improving the local routes in our community. I agree. I fully agree with you. And I, I'm not against LRT Phase 2 going to uh, Orleans now. North. What I'm saying is, in addition, we should now start to push for LRT Phase Three, so that LRT makes it to the communities around Navin and you know. We uh, we need to make Francois. You were completely correct when you said that the growth is in the south end of Orleans. We are seeing an enormous amount of growth in terms of residential development. We need to make sure that not only do we have the connections to the LRT and the dedicated bus routes that need to get people from one end to the other, but we also have to look at our road infrastructure. By building Brian Colburn and extending that to Anderson Road and by ensuring that we're looking at other routes and roads that need infrastructure uh, investment, we are then addressing all the needs of our growing community. We have to make transit an, a viable option for people so that they want to get on the bus. Otherwise, we're spending billions of dollars on a light rail transit system that nobody can connect to. 
Well, it's going to be difficult to connect to so long as it's just simply at Blair because then everybody's going to have to make their way to Blair. So no, I fully agree. We need to improve the bus routes and we need to improve the cycle, uh, the, the bicycle path as well. So there's very few north-south uh, bus routes in uh, throughout the ward and that's so certainly something that OC Transpo and once the, the, the LRT comes on, on, on track, I guess, uh, certainly it'll be something that we'll need to consider at that point. Well, actually, well, Mark, we have to look at is the Chapel Hill Park and Ride. Uh, we're supposed to be breaking ground on that this fall, should be ready next year. No one is going to use that park and ride again unless we fix our local routes and unless residents can get to that park and ride. We need to ensure there's connectivity to that park and ride from the residents south. Otherwise, we are not going to get residents on the train in November. Actually, as Tammy brought up a really good truck here for a second. Oh, just, I, as president of the uh, Chapel Hill South Community Association for so many years, I worked very closely with the Bradley Estates Community Association to to work on this plan to uh, to go through the hydro corridor uh, the, with the Brian Colbert extension to Reno Road and Anderson. And in terms of connectivity with the for the the cyclists and the pedestrians, that was a big issue that we brought up with the planners. Uh, along at the uh, at the consultations. Now, the other thing that is also being developed, it will be the the community design plan south of the water tower and the Cumberland Express, the Cumberland extension, uh, the bus route is supposed to go from from through uh, along Brian Coburn to Blair. So they've got a nice uh, system that's planned there. It's just a matter of making sure that that integration happens well. So we I'm also do, in my role. Sorry, for a So also in my role as president of the Blackburn Community Association, I've had the privilege of working with. Don and other community associations on the stakeholder working group that really worked with city staff to advocate on behalf of extending Brian Colburn. Now, the interesting part about that is the options that did come back didn't necessarily reflect the needs of the community. We need a councillor who is elected on October 22nd who will fight for the community and who will make sure that the needs of the community and the growth in the East End are being met so that we don't have to go back and tear up infrastructure that we've put in just to accommodate that growth. So LRT is going to be here in October, November, this fall. Blair is totally, totally not prepared to, to accept the influx, let alone the influx of, of buses that this will bring and the, the influx of, uh, of uh, cars as well, or the influx of, of bicycles. We want everybody to go and start to take the LRT because in my sense, I don't think there's going to be too many buses going west of Saint Laurent after the LRT is there. But we have not yet put in the intra infrastructure in place mm -hmm. just for this phase one. And now we're already discussing phase two. We need to correct. And your question was about what mistakes have we learned from phase one so we don't make them on phase two. That's certainly one of them. Put the infrastructure in place before. As you develop phase two, put the infrastructure in place to be able to accept bicycles, vehicles, people carpooling, buses with the new uh, LRT stations. The process of those stations is, is to make sure that you, that you don't have, they're, they're hoping not to have too many cars, so there will be no parking that's necessarily dedicated to it. And that is why the bus service servicing that the stations is extremely important. And we need to make sure that we integrate all, all the other project initiatives around that. The cycling routes are, are uh, the cycling lanes uh, uh, to, to get to those uh, stations is extremely important as well. It's going to be necessary, though, to still provide the park and ride adequate park and ride infrastructure at those stations. This will be interesting okay. to watch. We'll stop there. I asked you the question, Laura Dudas, so you get the final 30 seconds on this. Thank you very much, Mark. You know, the interesting part is, is that LRT is going to change how we see the East End. As a council, as councillor, I would support bringing economic development around that is tied to LRT and ensuring that people can connect to LRT stations by bus preferably, but also by psych, by bicycle, walking, and ensuring that they can get there by car if need be. Okay, thank you. Let's move to the next topic, which is economic development and employment. Uh, François Trépanier, I'll ask you the question. Uh, there's, it's no secret that many people in the East End feel that there has not been sufficient economic development. There are not enough jobs in the East End. That affects all kinds of things, including transit and traffic. Uh, you brought up in your opening statement the fact that you feel you can bring meaningful employment to Innis Ward. How exactly would you do that? Well, certainly. Thanks, Mark. Well, we've been talking about this economic development for a long time and there's not a whole lot that's been done. I think what we need to do is go outside, meet, you know, Toronto, Montreal, Maritimes, meet other uh, entrepreneurs that are looking to expand their uh, their businesses and, and, and demonstrate to them what 
Orleans and what Innis Ward can bring to them. We have the highest level of education per capita. We are well connected with uh, 417 Highway. We are near um, the airport. I mean, we need to meet them, talk with them, find out what their needs are, and attract them to invest in our ward so that we can put the infrastructure in place and have them come bring jobs to us. Okay, it's open to all of we you now on this topic. So, Francois, with all due, with all due respect to, to, it's a good plan to go out and visit other uh, or places. We already have some options at our disposal. For example, the uh, Ottawa Board of Trade uh, has created the Capital Build Task Force, and one of their priorities is to bring a, a federal node of employment out to Orleans. We need to jump on that, especially with the LRT that's coming. The window of opportunity is there. The other thing that I would like to propose is, uh, is to create a teleworking hub, a place where people who are who are for entrepreneurs or for people who work at home to actually congregate and meet. They could get a a, a desk where they could meet or, or an office with with our, the all the telecommunications tools that they need. So to create something where people don't have to get in cars and go further west, that they can actually sit and work in Orleans. We need to keep the jobs in Orleans. What we have to do if we want to bring federal federal jobs to Orleans. Unfortunately, we lost END to the West End. We need to push our, oh, federal, our federal partners. We need to work with our local MP, our local MPP, to ensure we can get good paying jobs in Orleans. There are only 50 federal jobs in Orleans out of I think it's over 135,000 federal jobs in Ottawa Gatineau. We can do better. And having jobs like this near LRT stations like Place d'Orléans would be great. So I think we need to work with our partners in order to get that done. So it's uh, as much as I, I completely agree, we need to support the Ottawa Board of Trade and the Heart of Orleans BIA in their initiative to bring federal jobs east. But at the same time, Council has tools at its disposal to really bring jobs and economic development. You know, as councillor, I would support economic hubs, as I mentioned before, tied to LRT. Really good opportunity to bring jobs here. I would bring tax incentive measures that we already have, including Section 37 of the Planning Act, to really bring business and employment opportunities. Ensure that zoning and planning processes are in place throughout the East End to encourage businesses to set up shop in Orleans and Innis Ward, and to make sure that we're supporting our local businesses. Small and medium businesses in the East End are the backbone of our current economy. We need to make sure that they, we don't lose sight of them. Yeah, but the federal government is not even protecting the current jobs that there are. Startup, is, uh, which is a big military establishment on Startup Road, is already set to move to Canada. Telesat is already set to move. I think they're going downtown. I mean, we're, we're watching jobs go and go and go and nothing's happening. And that's why we have to support uh, uh, places like the uh, Ottawa Board of Trade, and uh, of which the Orleans Board of Trade has just joined, and the Heart of or uh, Orleans BIA to, to do this. Now, one of the things that I would like to do would be to organize a summit of, uh, of residents, of, of employers, of uh, the four councillors, of uh, all people who might be interested in developing a vision for Orleans to build on the Ottawa Next 2036. This is just but we gonna, need a we're summit. We're talking about people, it and keep talking about it. We need, I, to, we need, we need to, to move into actions. We and bringing bringing the federal node out to Orleans, building a, tele, a teleworking hub would help with that. So, and I think that with the, having a summit where we, because Orleans is growing at a rapid pace, and this is a perfect opportunity to, to develop a vision for how we want it to look when so, we do have that LRT there when we've got these these uh, the uh, the uh, st. Joseph Boulevard uh, but built up That's what so we're I agree to do. with Francois that I'm done talking I mean for the last decade more so we've been talking about bringing jobs we've been talking about federal jobs keeping them there now we've seen them leave we need a counselor who can stand up for the East End and not just wait for others to do the job for us. And we need LRT to make sure here is that what's we going have to help instigate incentives, that. tax incentives that attract businesses. We need to make sure that we're leaving lands and making sure that zoning processes are in place for employment, for businesses. We need to make sure that the East End has its turn. We've seen a lot of investment in the West. We're seeing it in the South End. It's the East End's turn. And LRT is definitely a game changer, but it is not the end. We need a counselor who can do the job that needs to be done for our community. It doesn't have to be federal jobs. Everyone is focusing on federal, federal jobs. That's great. What we need is 
attraction to come to the East End. Look at Amazon. Councillor Blay was successful in bringing Amazon to Boundary Road. That is fantastic. It's great for the East End. It will, you know, create 600 jobs and I think 1,500 construction jobs. This is amazing for our city. We need more businesses like that to be attracted yeah, to the did East he, End. Did he go knock their, their door or did Amazon say, hey, we're looking for a place somewhere in Ottawa to move, right? I'm not convinced that, you know, like... It doesn't matter. I don't, it's I don't, coming I don't to the East the End and it is oh, great for the city of Ottawa. But is it by chance or is it really by effort from the councillors, right? So the, the, the interesting the part, the here. interesting the important part... thing is to make sure that we build the, that the city council build the infrastructure required to help Amazon in its development and that will attract other businesses businesses away as well so and what comes with that is also the restaurants and the gas stations and all of the residences that are going to be around that so that this is an awesome opportunity to to develop the East End and we need more of the businesses that will follow if we help them out so Donna I'm really glad you brought up infrastructure because one of the main reasons why the East End has not grown in terms of economic development is a lack of inf transportation infrastructure our roads are deteriorating we do not have the necessary roads to meet the volume of residential growth. We need to make sure that we're putting in the roads infrastructure, the transit infrastructure, that businesses will find attractive to locate in the East End. I disagree. I think we're pretty close to the airport. What, 20 minutes drive from the airport? We're right next to the 417, so they can ship to Toronto, they you can you ship just west. You can't do it ship. in the morning during commute time or in the evening coming well, back. that's part of it. So, so, so But, if, I mean, they are there already. So, I mean, if you, you know, disagree, Francois, then you're saying there's no need for the Brian Colburn that's extension. That's not what I'm saying. The Brian Colburn but extension is a totally separate topic. I don't see how it's separate I don't because see how it's Brian not. Brian Colburn extension is going to bring jobs to Orleans. I have no idea how you're going to do that. It's an integral part of moving people east yes, and west the way we're the way you're all proposing to do it is this is the wrong way. You're, you're proposing to just move the... the the, the the problem further down, you know. Okay, we need we'll to stop there. François Turpinier, you get the last 30 seconds anyway, so go right ahead. Sure. Okay. Brian Coburn needs to be extended. I fully agree, but it needs to go meet Wackley and reach right the 417 like that. Right now, you're just going to push the problem to uh, to Anderson, and it's not going to solve anything. I continue to believe that we need to create. We need to work with local businesses on creating local initiatives, but I also believe that we need to look elsewhere, see what success stories there are and capitalize on that sort of investment. All right, thank you. We'll move to the next question now, and I'll direct this to Donna Leith Goodbranson. Uh, what specifically can be done to improve the quality of roads, the flow of traffic, and the safety of local streets in Innes Ward? That's a great question, and as you knock on doors, that is the, que the, the question that keeps coming back over and over from residents is the infrastructure of our roads. We will start as, uh, with the Brian Coburn extension. From our perspective, that is a major infrastructure issue that we need to work on, and uh, I think we've already mentioned it uh, often enough that we want to go through the hydro corridor to Renault Road and Anderson, uh, and then hopefully later on to, uh, to uh, Walkley. The infrastructure of, our, of the streets, though, is something that we, I believe that we need better quality assurance and we need to, we need to make sure that, that we are not just relying on the people who are putting the asphalt down. We need to hold them to account to make sure that they use, are using quality products so that we don't have to waste the money and keep redoing it over and again. Okay, it's open to all of you now. You know, uh, <clears throat> Brian Gover, right to... Uh, right to Watley, right away. I mean, do it once, do it right. Uh, we're talking about 6.5 kilometers of highway, a project that would cost probably around $50 million. It's all flat. Like, let's do it once, let's do it right, let's do it for the next 50 to 70 years or even more. I fully agree we need to extend it, but let's take more time and do it properly. That's all I'm saying. We need to spend the money on roads now. What happens is we wait until the roads are in such poor condition that they are falling apart and they are beyond pothole repair and they need to be resurfaced. This year in the budget there was an extra $600,000 for pothole repair and every dollar of that gets used because the roads are in such poor condition. So I think if we spend a little more money and resurface the roads instead of just repatching them all the time, that will go a long and way. To we add to, to that sure is the fact that if you, if you use the poor quality asphalt to start with, it's just going to deteriorate again. So again, I believe that we need that quality assurance that, to, that, so that their builders are building to city of Ottawa standards. So then nobody, and that way they, we, we don't have to keep going agree. back with cold so patches no, and, and maybe repairs. not always go mm -hmm. to the lowest bidder. The lowest price is not necessarily the best price. Well, so I think we need to look so at 
that. That's probably the, question, the best product to use, right? I think the question was about how we are going to improve our roads. And I think, once again, nobody is denying that our roads are in a poor state of, of disrepair. And City Council, our councillor, whoever is elected in, in October, needs to put a focus on making sure that the East End has roads that are resurfaced and not just patched up. Because there is definitely a need within our community. I but I we also that. need to make sure, we also need to make sure that we're looking at you know, extending Brian Colburn extension to address the needs of the community, widening the Highway 174, just as was done in the in the West End, to accommodate our growth because we're growing rapidly. We're adding we're adding dedicated bus lanes to ensure that people want to use public transit to quicken up the speed of our buses, to make sure that our LRT stations are have adequate park and ride infrastructure safe, well-lit pedestrian infrastructure and make sure that we're providing cycling, bicycling, uh, parking and places to park, filling in our gaps in our cycling and pedestrian networks. And we need to make sure that on our roads, we're implementing traffic calming measures that and speed enforcement initiatives that meet the needs of our residential streets. So all those things you mentioned, Laura, that's quite funny because all of those items are listed in my platform and they have been since May 1st and it's interesting that I'm hearing that from you now. So in my platform I have talked about traffic calming, road improvements since May 1st and I continue to fight for that. I'm hearing it at the doors. Residents are fed up with the state of their streets. Some of the streets, it's deplorable. We managed to push to get Renault resurfaced this year. It was supposed to be done next year, but we fought for it and we got it. There are roads like St. Joseph Boulevard that is actually crumbling. It's supposed to be done next year and if elected, I'm going to make sure that road is done and it's not pushed further to another year. And Tammy, I completely Joseph agree. Boulevard, the issue there is that there's infrastructure underneath that is crumbling and that needs to be repaired. So it's it's not a, just an issue of putting a nice layer of, uh, of black tar on top of it because it, there's a big, a big, uh, and a big defi a deficiency of the pipes underneath and there is a lot of work to be done there. And again, this is the perfect opportunity the, to, with the arrival of the LRT and the overflow onto St. Uh, St. Joseph Boulevard to work with the Heart of Orleans BIA to work on the community improvement plan that was uh, that was tabled back in 2008 under Councillor Rainer Blois, we can actually work to, to really not just, just put a little polish on it, but to actually create something that is viable for years to come. I, I believe, I believe that, you know, and, and, oh, sorry, sorry, share your time there a bit there, Laura. Mm -hmm. There's other candidates there. I believe okay. that, you know, the city managers are doing their job. They have a limited budget. They're prioritizing their, the roads that need to be done. And, we, you know, everybody wants their road repaved. I remember knocking uh, a lady last time on Hunter's... Um, Hunter's Run. Hunter's Run. Run, thank you. And she's like, my road hasn't been paved in 25 years. And I look around, I'm like, what's the issue with your road? So, yes, everybody wants brand new asphalt. Uh, but, I mean, you know, we have a limited budget, so we have to operate within that. Speaking of asphalt, I'm not convinced that we have the best like you said, quality material, and maybe we, we need to consider other materials than asphalt for paving roads. I'm not saying we should, I'm not saying we should, but I'm saying we should consider other materials. I just want to respond to something that Tammy had brought up. You know, we have had traffic calming measures placed on roads, and that, that has been a benefit to certain communities. But we're still seeing that need. As I'm knocking on doors, people are still expressing concerns about the speed of traffic on the roads and the amount of traffic on the roads. As councillor, I'm committed to working with these communities to make sure that we're getting the adequate traffic calming measures on these streets and enforcement initiatives. As the president of the Blackburn community and as a volunteer in the community for well over a decade now, I've been working with residents to advocate to the councillor's office, to advocate for, for a couple of terms now, to advocate to councillor's offices, and to advocate to the city that we need these things done and they need to answer the needs of our community. Are you assuming that we're just going to go ahead and decide what we're going to do without consulting the community? community? I don't think I said that at well, all. In you fact, I said, you can't make it sound just, like that. just as I have always well, done, I've all always us, all worked of us with the community, the community well, especially when it's time to... And you asked me a question. Oh. Traffic calming that was done in your community was as a result of the councillor fighting for it. I don't believe the, and, you and had Tammy, the anything to do with any of the traffic calming oh, that has I gone on me. in Blackburn Hamlet. I'm sorry. Well, it, you know what? Working with residents to slow speeds on Bearbrook was something that I most certainly did. I've worked with residents on Forest Valley, and okay. I look forward to doing that as councillor of time. Work. Let's uh, go back to Donna Leith Goodbranson for some final thoughts on this. You have 30 seconds. Thank you. 
After working in Councillor Rainer Blois's office for six years and Tim Tierney's office for the last six for six months uh, recently, I've gained a lot of experience on the process of how to deal with staff and how to how to uh, move these uh, move these things forward. The most important thing is to do some cons community consultation to find out where we can prioritize some of the uh, some of the routes routes that need to be fixed. There is a lot of infrastructure work to be done. We need to make sure that there is quality assurance there. And as councillor, I will take care of that. Okay, thank you. Next question will be to Tammy Lynch. Should Ottawa have been more proactive in addressing the opioid crisis rather than relying on volunteers to set up a pop-up injection site in a park, for example? And would you support the city launching more uh, supervised injection facilities in the community? Okay, good question, Mark. Um, actually, so the supervised injection sites that are currently in Ottawa are in I believe neighborhoods where there is a need. Um, I was asked this question if I thought that we should have SIS uh, in Innis Ward, and my response was no, because I feel they should be in the areas of the city that are really re required. What I think should happen, assuming if the province decides they're not going to fund these anymore, I really think we need to work at helping these these vulnerable residents and try and help them get off these addictions and drugs instead of, you know, finding a spot for them to safely do it. I understand we're losing people every day, but I want to help these residents. Okay. It's open to everyone now. You know, I, I recognize that the subject is incredibly polarizing. <clears throat> um, it, it's something that, though, we can't ignore. You know, Ottawa Public Health reported that in 2017 there was 64 deaths related to opiate use in that year alone and that's more than one death a week and you know as council as councillors as the city we need to make sure that we're providing the services that people in our community need to to stay healthy and to stay alive we need to make sure that we're taking that action and you know in the OPH report it identified that there was a need for these sites in in Vanier in Centretown and who am I as, you know, if I was to be elected as councillor to say no to those communities? If they felt the need, if their residents needed those services, I would fully support that. You know, in this ward, we don't even have, we're predominantly residential. We don't even have an LCBO, let alone a beer store. The OPH report did not identify Innis Ward as needing one of these sites. So if another ward were to need these, I would fully support it. Yeah. So would you support it if Innis Ward was identified as a ward requiring one. If Ennis Ward was identified as one needing it, we would have been in the media for, you know, That's we would have been I in the media. Asked. I said, had, would you support it? You know, if we had such a, a problem that people were losing their lives because of opiate use and we needed to make me take measures to do so, then I would want to talk to residents and I'd talk to OPH and we'd find the best way to serve their needs. Because if that's the case, then we've gone too far. But luckily, right at this point in time, Innis Ward is not in that position. So as I said, if there are areas of the city that most need these sites, then I'm all in favor of that because they need those services. I'm not going to say that Innis Ward needs it at this time because that has not been identified. If that were to come to pass, then I would deal with it at that point. Still got four minutes. Uh, it's no, a debate. I, it's I, back I and forth. Well, I, I thought it was a debate, but okay. <laughs> the, uh, the opioid crisis is a national crisis, and it is, it's absolutely, it's sad. it makes me sad to see so many people who are losing their lives. Uh, I think there's a few issues that we need to deal with here uh, in terms of, of uh, trying to make sure that uh, that the province does not download it to the municipalities again because that's, there's just one taxpayer for it paying for everything and the municipality can't take on any more, especially with the, uh, the arrival of uh, cannabis, uh, the new legislation with cannabis. So there is a lot going on in terms of uh, enforcement for police, etc., and trying to maintain those budgets. So my first thing as councillor would be to try and work with province, and hopefully they would they would not download it to the uh, to the municipality. And uh, that's a very yeah. topic to address. It's very delicate. Uh, you know, what do we do? We spend money on saving lives, or we spend money on making sure children have roofs on their over their head and have you know full full stomach to go to school. If we inject some money in there, and pardon the pun, I mean, we have to take, eventually, you know, we'll have to take the money from somewhere else, right? I'm more about prevention. I'm more about 
putting money towards prevention. I understand when it's a crisis, it's a crisis. We deal with it, and we find ways that the crisis no longer comes back. I don't know that it's happening at the moment. I think we're just patching the problem with creating those 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 uh, SIS, especially the pop-up ones. I think it's just a, a patchwork, but I would like to see more money into prevention and certainly more money into ensuring that this doesn't occur anymore. Be beyond prevention, you also have to go into helping the people who are currently affected by this the most. And they need social services to support them, to help them get well. Addiction is an illness, it's a disease, and we need that. We need to provide, the, and this is the, the city's responsibility, to provide them with the social services that they need to get well. Many of the sites that currently exist do provide additional services and resources for people who are accessing these sites. And we need to make sure that as a council, we're supporting their initiatives. We need to make sure that they have the resources they need in order to address this, this crisis. Um, you know, as councillor, I would once again, I would support these sites that are located in Vanier and Centertown and make sure that they're meeting the need where the need is exists. Okay, does anyone else want to talk about that? Okay, we can we can wrap up there. Um, uh, Tammy Lynch, I asked you the question, so you get the final 30 seconds on this. Okay, no one will disagree. This is a very touchy subject. I mean, nobody wants to see anyone dying of these overdoses. It, it's, it, of course, it, it's very sad. Um, I think proper location is key and, you know, speaking to residents, speaking to the community is, is really important. I mean, it happened when we had these pop-up marijuana shops in our ward open up and people were not ha happy about it. Um, there was supposed to be an announcement from the province this afternoon. I was hoping to hear something before this debate, but I didn't. Okay, let's stop there. Uh, we'll go back to Laura Dudas for the next question. Uh, I think a lot of people have raised a concern about uh, the level of spending by the City of Ottawa over the last four years when tax increases have been kept to 2% or lower. Uh, there are people who feel that uh, that's put pressure on city budgets and expenditures and investments in areas like infrastructure and social services. Where would you want to see tax increases over the next four years and what would you do about the perceived shortfalls in some of those areas? It's a very good question, Mark, and it's actually one I'm hearing a lot at the door. Uh, councillor for the last two terms of council for the last eight years has set a cap of 2% that was reasonable and affordable. A 2% cap is a good target for the increase coming council and will give residents a predictability that they can then budget for in their own personal finances. Okay, it's open to all of you on the subject of taxes and city finances and spending in areas like infrastructure and social services. We have a lot of expenses that are coming down the pipeline. Again, I'm coming back to the, uh, the new legalization of uh, marijuana. This is going to create a, uh, uh, a big uh, uh, pressure on the police services and in, on Ottawa in general. The, so there are other expenses, exp uh, infrastructure and uh, so many other things that we need to consider. Social housing, uh, inclusionary zoning is one of the issues that is going to be coming into, uh, that's going to be, be the responsibility of the next uh, council. The inclusionary zoning is ensuring that, that uh, the new developments have a certain number of units that are, uh, that are accessible to uh, people who are, who are below the poverty line or who have special needs. And so, uh, but there's going to be a lot of pressures. So the 2% cap, while is, is uh, absolutely laudable, uh, there has to perhaps be a little bit of wiggle room. I uh, think the main thing is to make sure that we uh, eliminate any wastage where it is, where it exists. Uh, and that's, the, again, the responsibility of council to take a look at that. And uh, we also have to consider the, uh, the uh, announcement yesterday that, the, that there is a 14.4 uh, million dollar uh, uh, surplus that, uh, that we can draw on. So perhaps we can keep it down to the 2% for now. But uh, we have to do have to consider all of the extra uh, things that are coming down the pipeline, especially with the cannabis legislation. I agree. Uh what with uh, Donna said regarding the the cannabis legislation we are going to have to increase our police budget if we want I just don't feel like our OPS officers are prepared for this we need to be able to give them the tools how to deal with this you know when they pull over a driver how they're going to be able to detect this so I definitely would like to see more money for police services I am totally on board with keeping taxes at 2%. I think it's reasonable. And as 
as a councillor, I would not support raising taxes above 2%. I think 2% is reasonable, however, you know, the expected inflation rate over the next four years certainly are expected to rise between 2.06 to 2.15, they're below 2% right now. So I think following over the next few years, somewhere around the inflation rate would would make sense to me. It would give us a bit of wiggle room. Although, although if it's 2.7% uh, uh, inflation rate, that means that it's going to affect everybody on so many other levels. So I think it, it behooves us even more to make sure that we keep that tax rate as low as possible so that people can ex can uh, can know what to expect in terms yeah, of their taxes. You, if you look at what the experts are saying, Standard & Poor's considered as one of the three large uh, credit agencies in North America are giving the double A cut to uh, Double the mark to to the city of Ottawa. They're saying that the future of Ottawa is stable. Our economy economy is solid. The, the managerial practices are are sound, and the city of Ottawa has a multi-year long-term plan that the managers have developed and that they've been following. So we have you know uh, yearly budget targets. Uh, the the revenues and expenses are reasonable. So. I think I agree. 14.4 million in the article did mention that you know it was ironic that, that this is an election year. Suddenly we have a surplus. That aside, uh, you know I think I think we can uh, we can raise it, but very carefully. Well, surpluses are you know a matter of interpretation, right? We we saw that there was an extra 10 million dollars put toward infrastructure during the last round of budget talks, and we're looking now at this surplus of 14 million. So. We can't, we can't just depend on it being a surplus, but residents need a councillor who can say that a target of 2% is what they can budget on because our personal finances as taxpayers, you know, we're not seeing, we're not seeing those 2% increases from our employers. You know, the public service, the federal public service is seeing increases of about 1.5% on average. So as a councillor, we need to make sure that we're being reasonable and responsible and keeping property taxes affordable so people can budget accordingly. So we need more police services. We need more help for the people with the, the, the drug crisis. We, we all want our roads to be paved. That money is going to have to come from somewhere. And people have to realize it's nice to put demand on council, but you know, I mean, it's, it's a check and balance. You can only do what you have with the money you have. And if you don't increase the pot, you'll never be able to do more than you're doing now, short of you know, going inside, like you said, and, and looking for efficiencies that we can improve the system with. Does any, do any of you want to talk about the state of the city's finances uh, more generally, whether or not the city has an acceptable level of debt? And, and I did mention before some of the pressures on expenditures, whether uh, there are areas where you'd want to see more investment. Well, the debt is decreasing year after year, so there's a long-term plan, and that's what Standard & Poor's is saying. You know, like the city of Ottawa, as far as they're concerned, they're healthy financially. Yes, we have a debt, but we're servicing our debt, and our debt's going down every year. Our revenues are... Uh, increasing uh, uh, faster than our expenses are increasing. So as long as we keep the revenues up and the expense down, we're going to be fine. And that's and a, it's going to take a long time, but I we will eventually pay it off. I think we need to take it one step further and see where we can find efficiencies as well, because surely there are some places that we can find efficiencies to reduce that even more. Yeah, fully agree. The, the city's budget uh, financial status is incredibly good. In fact, the assets that the city has is about 19% of its, of its uh, deficit rate. So it, it's Basically, we have a large amount of assets that we can then uh, count upon. Um, you're completely right, Francois, and that our budget rating is triple A. We're doing amazingly double, well. Double A. Double a. Well, I'm giving us the benefit of the doubt, I suppose. We're doing incredibly well. But the fact is, is that taxpayers also need to make sure that they have a predictable property tax increase that they can budget for. They want to make sure that they're seeing value for their taxpayer dollars. And as a council, Despite the, the wonderful job that the city staff are doing to keep our budget at a good state and making sure that we're managing with the, the amount that we're pulling in from tax dollars and revenues and our assets, we also need to make sure that council is responsible to the taxpayers. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Laura Dudas, I asked you the question, so you do get the final 30 seconds here if you'd like to say something else. Thank you, Mark. I, I wanted to note, too, that, you know, we, we often talk about efficiencies and, and cuts. You know, that's something that politicians often say. A lot of the times it's about smart budgeting. You know, city council also, ha also has to look at its contracts. And when it's putting out contracts to uh, to contractors, we have to hold them accountable to make sure that they're fulfilling their 
their duties. A prime example would be the million dollar penalty that we did not go after in the LRT scenario that was taxpayer dollars that were left on the table. Okay, thank you. Next question to François Trépanier. Should Ottawa opt out of having private cannabis stores? And if not, would you support having a private cannabis store in your ward? What else does the city need to do to manage a smooth transition to legal cannabis? It, that's not a you know, difficult topic to address. <laughs> As I said last night, 52 years I've never done cannabis and I'm not about to start now. So it's not a topic I'm extremely familiar with. Opting out, the danger with that is the, the, it, it's here. I think it's here. And no matter what we try to do, if we try to opt out, it's going to happen anyway. Will I support it in our ward? Absolutely not. But I'm afraid that it may be uh, beyond my full control. So we need to we need to have a proactive approach R rather than have things imposed upon us. You know, I think we need the council needs to be uh, proactive in deciding where to put them so they are not all co-located in one strip. And certainly. If that's what the taxpayers want, and I'm not convinced it is, but I think that's what you know the federal government is imposing on us, so we're stuck with that. Okay, it's open to everyone now. To jump in on that, I think uh, I think the the one point that you're correct in is that uh, that we're not going to have a lot of choice in this. I think and and opting out, although would be something that I would consider. I don't think it's something that is realistic. And I think we need to get our heads out of the sand and and accept the reality that is coming. We will be having, uh, we will be having the cannabis stores retailers here in Ottawa. Uh, and uh, to be realistic as well, you have to consider that we will have them in, uh, in our ward, in Innis Ward. And so I think the main thing is to make sure that we keep them away from the schools and the, the uh, parks where our children are. I think Beyond that, though, it's important to educate our children, spend some time to talk to the younger children so that they understand that they shouldn't even start to, they, uh, consuming pot because the brains are not fully developed at that time. So it's going to be very hard to keep it out of our ward, and the main thing is to try and keep it away from our children. I, I'd like to point out that the provincial government's decision, the Ford government's decision to only sell it online with cannabis stores, I think is a good decision. So between October 17th and April, that's the only way you will be able to purchase it if you're the over 19. Way? Legally. <laughs> Legally. The only legal way. It's still going to be um, very available after on that, the legal market. Um, I agree with my candidate uh, colleague here that it probably will end up coming in our ward. Do I support it? No, but we have to make sure, number one, it's not near schools like the illegal ones that were open previously. We have to ensure our residents are consulted. If they want this, we need to make sure it's in the right location. We also need to ensure that our OPS have the right tools to deal with this. They need support because this is a big deal and we probably will not be able to stop it, but our residents can have a say. In this ward, I, I, I believe I mentioned it in a previous question, is almost exclusively residential. And we do not even have an LCBO or the beer store located within our ward boundaries. I was in favor. I go door knocking. People open the, the door original, and I can smell pot. The original plan, I'm not sure which houses you're going to, but the original plan <laughs> by the, the all, previous all the provincial, areas. sorry, friends, the provincial government was to model the location and the distribution of cannabis on the LCBO model. I support that model because it really does give the city a framework for how it's going to regulate and locate these sites. And I completely agree. We're all going to say that we don't want it near schools or where our teens or our youth congregate. We need to make sure that it is in a, a regulated fashion that is modeled on something similar to the LCBO model. Unfortunately, you the, the province has pretty well made it clear that that is not going to happen already. And and I mean, in Blackburn Hamlet, there was a, there was a pot shop there. There was one down next to the Kumon uh, the teaching school down on St. Joseph Boulevard. So although we don't have an LCBO or a beer store, we still had pot shops. And so it's really a matter of regulating where we're going to put them. And I think the council that uh, council has a responsibility and an opportunity to try and, and be very very clear on where they're going to be. Either way, it's unfortunate, but but cannabis is available to everybody. We're going to be growing it in our homes if that's what if that's what residents want to do. And so it is out there, it is available. Matter is making sure that we have police in place to ensure that, they, that the roads are safe so that
that people aren't driving and try to educate people as much as possible on the on the uh, the uh, the bad effects of uh, the cannabis consumption. But I think we need to be council needs to be proactive. Like let's decide where we're going to put them first, and then go to the province with our plan rather than being imposed a plan by the province. And that's 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 what I'm pushing for. It's going to come anyway, uh, you know, and, and that's the danger with you know going with the, the LCBO side. We don't have one in the in in the in in this ward. So where do you put it then, right? So let's decide now where we want these establishments to be and give our plan to, to the provincial government and, uh, and be proactive about it. You know, council, council, proactive council needs... It's actually being the councillor at the table and this is being given as a responsibility to each municipality. So we have to take that responsibility and not pass it back up to the province. They're not going to have any say. They're simply going to say, you deal with it, this is your city. And the so it's our responsibility to make sure that we are proactive and that we are looking for the best locations for these shops. The councillor for Innis Ward will need to reflect the needs of Innis Ward. And as I mentioned before, we don't have an LCBO, we don't have the beer store, which we're privately owned. We need to make sure that as we're looking at bringing cannabis shops into the city of Ottawa we're doing it with the community's needs in mind so having a counselor that will work with the community to make sure that its needs are being met and that we're addressing all the concerns that are out there in respect to the locations in respect to the access by by children uh, we need to have an active and vocal counselor who will ensure that Innis Ward's needs are being fought for but everybody at the door will tell you, no, I don't want it in my backyard. Nobody wants it in their backyard. No, but as I said, you know, right. it doesn't matter where I went through the yard. I've, I've, I've smelled marijuana and, you know, a lot of houses in all the neighborhoods. So it is happening. It's already here. And now we're, we're considering, you know, where to actually put the official establishment, which is still going to compete with the black market. Well, and that's why we need a councillor who will stand up and make sure that it's going where our residents want it to be. We don't want to end up with these pop-up uh, pop locations. As you mentioned, I think it was Donna, forgive me, that you know Blackburn and the location near Kumon on St. Joseph, those were sites that popped up illegally and they were shut down by the police. And I commend the police for taking that action. We need to make sure that we're strictly regulating where these shops go so that there's no surprises, so that we can accept where they go and we can control it and we need a councillor who can fight for what the community needs need in this respect. We need to respects. take it one, one step further and make sure that we provide the police with the tools to enforce uh, not just the, the problems on the road or elsewhere but to make sure that if there are pop-up sites that do come up that they are taken care of swiftly. That's right, and that's yeah. why we have to take advantage of the Ontario government that's offered or offered. We're okay. going to provide $40 million for municipalities to okay. deal with enforcement. That's time. François Trépanier, I asked you the question. You get the last 30 seconds. Thanks, Mark. I, I continue to believe that the federal government has acted way too fast on this file. I understand that they wanted to decriminalize marijuana. Uh, I think they should have done that, maybe wait a couple of years before they actually legalized the, the the stuff, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> police corps, uh, police uh, services across the country, not just in Ottawa, are telling us they're not ready, they don't have the necessary tools, they can't do roadside testing on drivers. So I'm not in favor of these kinds of establishments in our, uh, in our ward, but certainly I don't think we're going to be able to right. fight it. That's time, thank you. We are going to move to the closing statements now, and once again, we are going to do those in the reverse order of the opening statements. Each candidate will have one minute to speak to you directly, and we are going to start with Tammy Lynch. Go ahead. Thank you, Mark. Since May 1st, since I filed my papers, I have been consistent with my platform, with my messaging. My key priorities, my number one priority for Innis Ward is the Brian Coburn extension to Renault Road now referred to as option seven. Also, sm smarter transit to LRT stations, get people on the bus and out of their cars, road improvements, community consultation, neighborhood traffic calming. I have to reiterate that having worked in the inner Innis Ward office this term of council, there will be no learning curve for me. I know what the issues are in the community and I am ready to continue to work for the residents of Innis Ward on day one, December one. Being a counselor is not a Monday to Friday, nine to five job, as we know. With my children out of the house, I have the time, the passion, and the energy to devote to being the city counselor for Innis Ward. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next up is Donna Leith Goodbranson. Go ahead. 
I'd like to thank Rogers once again for organizing this debate, and I'd like to thank you too, Mark, uh, for, for moderating. I'd like to thank the viewers and uh, residents of Innis Ward who are taking the time to view this, who care enough about Innis Ward to listen to us as we discuss these issues. After consulting with you with the residents both at the door and uh, in my previous roles uh, in, 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 as a volunteer in the community, I've put forward a carefully thought out vision of my priorities of Innis Ward, which responds to the needs of the community and my commitment to build consensus, set realistic goals, and to bring the right people and resources together to achieve results. On a final note, among the four candidates running for Innis Ward, I am the only fluently bilingual woman, and might I add that council at this time uh, has a lack of uh, women at the table and francophones, so I'm just going to put that plug in there. And uh, so on October 22nd, or at the advanced polls, I'm asking you to vote for me to become your municipal councillor. My name is Donna Leith Goodbranson. Thank you. Next, François Trépanier. Go ahead. Thank you again for listening to the debate. As a bilingual candidate with three university degrees, including a Master's of Public Administration and a second Master in Education, 28 years of service in the Canadian Forces, 20 years of management, and now evolving as a successful entrepreneur, I have the education, the leadership, the experience to best represent all of us at City Hall. I commit to improving our local economy, creating conditions for growth. I commit to developing the necessary infrastructure, building relationships with every elected officials, and working with both local business leaders and expanding businesses elsewhere to attract meaningful, meaningful employment to Ottawa. I commit to improving public safety across the Ward to ensure safer streets for our families and our children and to improve the services we all receive from the City of Ottawa. I urge you to visit my website at francoistrepanier.ca. Make the strong choice for the most educated counselor, a local entrepreneur who has accumulated the experience that, is best re that will best represent all of us at City Hall. On October 22nd, the only choice is François Trepanier. Thank you. Merci. All right. Thank you. Finally, the closing statement from Laura Dudas. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Mark. Throughout this debate, we've heard a lot about the issues that have been affecting the East End and Innis Ward. It's important that we have a councillor who will address the priorities of Innis Ward residents. As councillor, I am committed to supporting economic development in the East End and job growth, supporting or addressing the road, forgive me, addressing the road infrastructure deficit, including the Brian Colburn extension and public transit. Third, protecting and enhancing green space in our community and keeping our property taxes affordable and reasonable. And finally, giving police the resources they need to keep our community safe. If elected in October, I will fight for our community. I will fight for Innis Ward. I will fight for you. All right. Thank you. Thank you to all the candidates for participating in this debate. Best of luck in the rest of the campaign. And thank you for watching the debate for Innis Ward. I want to remind you that Election Day is October the 22nd. That's when you'll be able to vote throughout the city of Ottawa. And you'll be able to watch live election results and hear them on Rogers TV and on 1310 News Radio once the polls close at 8 o'clock. I hope you can join us then. Thanks for watching.